Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, federal officials give the okay for another light rail extension in Mesa. We'll look at the differences in funding between charter schools and traditional public schools, and we'll learn about a charity that focuses on kids who've lost loved ones. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Federal officials gave the okay last week to another light rail extension in Mesa. This one will take the tracks out to Gilbert Road. Here to tell us more is Jody Sorrell, Mesa's Transit Services Director. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now this again goes from goes from like just past Pioneer Park out to Gilbert. How far are we talking here? It's about 1.9 miles this extension. Okay and this construction starts when? Well, we're right now we're in the preliminary design phase, so we have a little bit more work to do. Construction probably won't start until like mid to late 2015. And completed when? Um, by 2018. By 2018. Mm -hmm. So this should go through what is now being constructed in downtown Mesa all the way out to Gilbert. Why is this important for Mesa? Um, getting to Gilbert Road, extending a light rail to, to Gilbert Road was very important to our council and to the city because once you get to Gilbert Road, you have options. Gil Gilbert is a connector to two major freeways, so it's easier. A station at the end of the line is easier to access. Um, it just provides a better gathering point for some of the, the light rail riders and the buses to, to serve that area. A good park and ride out there, a, I would imagine. A good Probably park a and ride. a massive park and ride out a there. A fairly good size yeah. one, yes. Um, how, now, the feds had to give the okay for this. What were they looking at? What kind of environmental, historical, cultural factors? Every, every federal project goes through the environmental assessment process. And, they look at things from, you know, historic resources. Are you hitting historic buildings, historic signs? Um, what is the noise and vibration impacts? What are the real estate impacts? What are the traffic impacts? All of those factors go into the document, a, a big document that's submitted to the federal government. Anything come up? Any, any concerns more than the usual? There was really nothing in the, um, the way the, the alignment is designed, we really minimized a lot of the impacts um, to the community. There's um, no historic impacts along there. Um, there's, except for some minor right away, no mm -hmm. real buildings or signs, structure impacts along with this. So we were pretty excited about that. And uh, as far as the costs, what are we talking about here and how will that be paid for? Well, the preliminary estimate for the project is about $143 million. Um, and we're, we're doing some creative, we've, we've doing a unique financing. We're not going the typical route where we go to the FTA and we ask for a grant. Um, we are looking at taking some formula, federal money that's coming to Mesa anyway for streets, repurposing that street money and making it into transit capital. So we're kind of flexing it into transit capital and we can use that to build the extension. So this money w that was set aside for road and street projects can now be set aside for this and the feds say that that's fine. Yep. And what about the match? Does that change at all? Um, the match does change because for the street element, it was about a 30% local match that had to go into it. For the um, this particular project, it's a 5.7% oh match. Oh my goodness! So it, it does save Mesa some money in that in that realm. And, and it sounds like Mesa's thinking uh, city bonds make sense mm -hmm. for something like this. But I, I understand the city bonds might be repaid by the feds as well. Well, what this is is um, you know you may have heard when people try to advance freeways along or through the valley, there's something called HPAN, Highway Project Advancement Notes. Um, two years ago, coming up on two years, the legislature passed um, Transportation Project Advancement Notes, which allows us to issue those no notes for transit projects, as well, transit capital. So that's what we'll issue um, to pay for this and then um, pay it back with other reimbursement money coming back to the city. Okay, so, it, it, but it, it almost sounds as if it's gonna pay for itself, or pretty doggone not close quite, to it. Not quite, not quite. Yeah, pretty yeah. close to it though, for, I mean, for $7 million for 1.9 extension for light rail, that's not, not a bad deal. Well, we do have the financing costs with all of that as well, but yeah, yeah it's, um, it's a good deal. Um, the 3.1 extension that goes through downtown, that one's not even finished yet, correct? Update on that. Right, one. that one's not finished yet. We um, had been under construction for a couple years, um, right now, it's if you drive in downtown or if you drive through Mesa between the Sycamore Station and past the Arizona Temple, you'll see lots of barricades and lots of construction, which is a good thing. It's a sign of progress. Um, in the downtown area, we have the construction moratorium in the winter months to kind of give the businesses a breather and help the tourists navigate into downtown. So that will go until May 1st, but um, you're going to start seeing 
the utility relocation is done and you're going to start seeing the work in the middle of the street um, where the tracks start getting laid in the middle of the street. And that's a 3.1 extension that's in downtown. What we're looking at right now is the, the extension that we talked about earlier, and that's the one that extends from the one. Will this get started as the 3.1 is still being constructed? No, they should be done just about, the 3.1 should be done, but because that should be done really um, by late 2015. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Gilbert Road, the next 1.9 mile to Gilbert Road won't start until later that year. You mentioned moratorium on, on business uh, as far as uh, construction. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. some would say there's a moratorium on business when you have right. this kind of construction. Um, talk about the impact to businesses. Obviously, it hurts. What do you tell the folks now with this extension, the 1.9 extension? What did you tell the folks in downtown? Well, we um, construction is construction. It's going to, and anytime you get in front of on a street, it does impact people. Um, Metro and the Mesa and the city have worked to develop some business assistance programs um, that we're encouraging the businesses to take care of. One of the things that we did on the first 20 miles that I think helped a lot of business at least get an idea what to expect is we were fortunate enough to have already gone through light rail construction. So we brought some of those businesses in to talk about what would they do differently? How would they prepare? What did they learn? What should these businesses look out for? So some of that um, has helped a lot of the businesses take take advantage of some of the programs. And I guess with this extension, you'll have another group of folks that can we'll walk We'll have another say, group yeah. that can walk. We can just bring them right down the street. <laughs> <laughs> a little parade there. Exactly. Since nothing else is. Well, congratulations on It sounds like a lot of things are happening there in Mesa, so it must be an exciting place to work. There are. Yeah, and, and it's good to have you here. Thank you. A group of charter school students and their families are asking the Arizona Court of Appeals to reverse a Maricopa County Superior Court ruling that upholds the current funding system for K-12 schools. Those appealing the ruling say that the system gives much more money per pupil to traditional public school students at the expense of charter school students. Joining me now is the plaintiff's attorney, Corey Langhofer, and also joining us is Arizona Education Association President Andrew Morrill. Good to see you both here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, talk to us about this suit now. Where, where is in court, what are you asking the appeals court to do? So, uh, Ted, Arizona's education funding system is outdated. The major parts were put in place in 1980 uh, when Arizona had one fax machine at the time. It's very old. And because of the, de uh, it's so outdated, there's uh, significant disparities or inequalities baked into the system. Um, the average student in a public school uh, gets about $8,800 of funding per year. Some, school, uh, some schools, though, have as much as $19,000 per year for their students. There's huge disparities. And so what the lawsuit is asking is for the Court of Appeals to say to the legislature, it's time you revisit the system. It's time you update this outdated system and make it more equal, more fair. Is it not equal? Is it not fair as it stands now? Well, as complicated as the education funding has been in Arizona, one thing, the legislature has modernized it by cutting about $1.5 billion over the last five years. So it has been adjusted. And we would stipulate that it's been uh, insufficient and underfunding students, whether you're talking about charters or traditional schools. But we've got to get our numbers right, Ted. The fact is that it's really not disputed among education groups. Even the Joint Legislative Budget Committee will tell you that in terms of state funding per pupil, charter schools actually get more per pupil than traditional schools. That's why you see right now and in the last session about 60 schools converting over to charter school funding so that they can get that additional funding. So let's make sure we're talking about state funding, which is what this is really about. How do you see that? Uh, there's a discrepancy in the discrepancy here. That's right. So the um, 
it's not it's not accurate. It is true that many public district schools are creating charters within the public district system so that they can sort of double dip. If there's a gimmick in the law you can take advantage of to get extra money for district schools by calling them charters. Um, the the record in the case just doesn't show though that the charter schools are overfunded. When you look at all of the appropriated state funds that go to charter schools, we get about a uh, thousand to thirteen hundred dollars less per student every year. That's what the evidence in the case shows. Okay, wh wh why the, what's going on here? It, we're well, seeing numbers over here, we're seeing numbers over there. Right, what? and what we need to do is take a look at the federal funding that is offered to school districts with additional responsibilities attached to those. We know that we've got local funding mechanisms of overrides and bonds, and that really points to the fundamental difference of charter schools versus traditional public schools. Yes, they're all publicly funded, but one major difference is that when communities fund overrides and bonds, those assets that add to the district remain in the public sector. Those are public assets. So buildings expanded, buildings built, they remain in the public trust as taxpayer funded and taxpayer owned. You don't see that with charter schools. So there are a number of differences. Um, teacher certification requirements, the mission of charter schools, when you look at the spread across our charter schools in Arizona, the student bodies being served, the representation of ethnic diversity, the special needs students, one begins to feel that there's a slightly different mission to our charter schools. The courts evidently found so because they rejected some of the claims as to the inequitable funding. So the, the basic point that I don't think is controversial is students have to be treated equally, right? It's not fair to start charter students or public school students behind the line, right, at a, at a disadvantaged spot compared to other students. And I think just from our conversation here, you can see our system is so complicated uh, you've got funding streams from um, local taxes, federal taxes, state taxes. It's so complicated and it's been so long since it's, it was updated that we have no longer have a guarantee that our students are being treated equally regardless of where they attend schools. To Andrew's point though, it sounds as though the students being served, that particular uh, focus here, that's not equal as well. Charter schools do have more freedom in what they do and how they do it as opposed to traditional public schools. If that's the case, should the funding still be exactly the same? So it is true that charter schools have less regulation than public district schools. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why with, the same, with less funding, we're able to achieve the same results as public district schools. The mismatch though in funding between district schools and charter schools hasn't actually been tied to those regulations. It's just a, a number that has sort of come about through happenstance. It's if it were actually tied, if the difference in funding were tied to those regulations, it would be a lot better argument for the state, but right now it's just a difference without a reason. Is it fair that charters don't have the safety net of taxing, of bonding, of overrides? Well, they may not have those, but they have the ability to control the funds that they're receiving in ways the district simply cannot. Case in point, we know that small schools get additional funding from the state. Charter schools have the ability to treat each of the schools within a charter as a separate entity. Districts have to add up all the schools, and if they go over the total, they can't access that funding. So really this is a disparity as you said within a disparity but the mission, the relationship of traditional schools to the community, the separation that makes charters publicly funded but able to hold private assets within a private structure um, really makes this a lot more complicated than just the, uh, the question of should the funding be exactly the same. The courts so far have said as long as we're funding charter schools consistently and traditional schools consistently, they do not in fact have to be funded the same because they actually have different missions. Is consistency more important to the plaintiffs, uh, more so than making that number, whatever it is, equal, even though, again, charter and traditional public not necessarily equal? What, what is essential, what can't be changed, is that students have to have equal starting points. Um, you can't say that um, the charter school system has the same results as the public uh, district system and therefore it's fine. We have to be given the same starting point and under the current system that's outdated, we don't have that. No st starting point, not the same. Agree? Well, we've backed off the starting points to the point where the funding is inadequate across all of our schools. But look at the distribution of charter schools across the state. Some are exploring uh, serving student needs and students in areas that they haven't uh, traditionally. Let's remember that charter schools came into the state on a promise of better for cheaper. We haven't seen the better because they perform at about the same distribution of traditional schools. Now the cheaper argument seems to be being wrestled with and changed somewhat uh, in, in this case and in other situations. Is it okay though to see that better and cheaper, that formula may not be working 
let's go ahead and tinker, let's go ahead and improve if it means better education for one kids. Of the, one of the things we could do with charter schools anytime we wanted was simply say, for the expansion of funding into capital areas to build buildings, that's fine, but those will retain and stay state property. If they're publicly funded, why not have them remain as public assets? That would be interesting. But there are many challenges that the charter schools launch where they say, on the one hand, we want public funds, but we don't want to play by the same rules as other public schools. Our charter is willing to play by the same rules if that does mean exact same funding. I think those sorts of updates are exactly the sort of modernization we need in the system. I think you're willing to have that conversation. We want to have that conversation. Real quickly, before we let you guys go, um, this idea of charter schools having to repay money, I know that's in the courts as well. Where does that stand? What's going on here? So. Uh, this is a completely separate matter, but in, in 2011 and 2012, the State Department uh, of Education had a way of allocating uh, tax dollars to schools. And they changed that method in 2013, and they wanted to apply the new method backwards. So the money you received under the old plan should have been, uh, the, the department wanted to take some of that back under the new plan. And the, the new lawsuit is basically insisting that the Old rules apply then, and the new rules apply going forward. Only. About 30 seconds left here. Well, my understanding is that one of the problems with that particular issue is that you have charter schools that are um, not wanting to return money that, for years when they may not have even been operating. So I'm not, um, I'm not sure that, that uh, it's as simple a matter as it seems. I know that uh, districts that ended up owing money, and there weren't very many, are under a plan negotiated with the Department of Education to pay that funding back. Um, the, the districts who were, that received excess money under the new rule that has just been approved all get to keep the funding. We're not trying to take money away from districts at all. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. many districts ended up actually being owed money. Um, my understanding from talking to the Department of Ed is that they try to negotiate as fair a settlement for everybody as was possible. Okay. Well, we'll stop it right there. Gentlemen, good discussion. Thanks, good to have you Thank both you here. Very Thank you very much. Thank you for joining good us. To see you, Losing a family member is difficult at any age, but for children it can be especially hard. In tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading, producer Christina Estes and photographer Stephen Snow show us how one group is helping children who've suffered the loss of a loved one. Steve was an amazing man. He was funny, um, hard worker, loyal, great father, amazing husband. Karen Turner's joy turned to pain in August of 2007 when her husband Steve died unexpectedly. He was 41 years old, I was 38, and our son was just four and a half. Telling her son was heartbreaking. When you talk to a child about grief, you can't say daddy's sleeping or daddy's gone away. You have to say, daddy has died, daddy's not coming back, daddy is dead. You have to use those words, and it's gut-wrenching. Steve's death meant the loss of Alan's basketball buddy, Karen's confidant and their financial security. When my husband died, our health insurance was carried through him and his company. Uh, we lost his, our insurance overnight. I lost his income overnight. As bills pile up, Karen says it's easy for parents to push aside the extras like sports, tutoring, and musical lessons. But it's the little things that can make a big difference. She's seen it with her own son. Right before Steve passed away, we had talked about enrolling him in T-ball. Uh, Steve had grown up playing Little League, he loved sports, he couldn't wait to get his son out on that ball field. And so when he died, I went ahead and enrolled him in T-ball. And, you know, first we played T-ball, then we played soccer, then we found flag football. And that was it for him. He just, on that field, he is like every other kid. Not one person there cares that his dad has died. They care that he's going to catch the ball and run it in. <laughs> you know, he's like every other kid. And that's important <laughs> for a child. Whoa. Seeing Alan smile made Karen smile and led her to create Acts of Simple Kindness. Acts of Simple Kindness stands for um, A, S, and K is A for my son Alan, S for my husband Steve, and then I'm Karen. The group provides financial grants to cover extracurricular activities for children who've lost parents. Set. <laughs> Susan Johnson used a grant to cover the Jimboree membership for her son. Duke was um, just turned six months. Uh, we had his half birthday and a week um, later his father um, took his life. He was dealing with, um, you know, he had issues with um, drugs and alcohol. Um, so I became a widow uh, when he was six months. And being a single mom in my 30s, I don't have any friends that have lost a, a spouse. All my friends are either single or newly married or, you know, in their happy times. 
and I didn't have anyone to relate to, to talk to about losing my husband. Until she met Karen and the other families involved in acts of kindness. <laughs> they understand moving forward is important, and so is cherishing the past. We miss him and we still like to talk about him. And I've often wondered what he would think about Ask. I, I didn't want his death to be in vain. I wanted to do something in his name. And I had no idea that an idea that literally started on the back of a napkin would turn into what it has. I'm extremely proud of what we're doing. Karen says the grants are gifts. All they ask in return is a photo of the child showing how the money was spent. We had one boy who was in a small town and when his dad down, died in a drowning accident, he felt very isolated. There was no one else in his class that really understood. So his mom allowed him to go to the college to take the rest of his courses so that he could graduate from high school. And I think one of the best pictures we got was when he sent us a picture of him in his cap and gown because he was able to graduate thanks to a grant that we had given him. Acts of Simple Kindness has helped nearly 60 children. The group relies heavily on corporate and individual donations along with a charity bowling party set for February. You can find out more information at actsofsimplekindness.org. Org. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, we'll see how Arizona 15-year-olds stack up in an international study measuring the proficiency in reading, math, and science literacy. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.